Whenever there's been black progress in this country politically, there's always been backlash. And so what we're seeing right now all across the South and particularly in places like Georgia, we're seeing the, leg the state legislators take up these bills to actually prevent black voters, to disenfranchise black voters and make it difficult for voters to participate in the process. Welcome to At Liberty, a weekly show where we go deep on the civil rights and civil liberties questions of our time. I'm Molly Kaplan, multimedia director at the ACLU and your host. This week, I'm talking with political strategist and organizer Latasha Brown about how Black voter empowerment is reshaping the South. Latasha, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you for having me, Molly. I'm happy to be here. You know, um, between mobilizing first for the presidential election and then for a hugely consequential Senate runoff election, all in the middle of a global pandemic. I, I feel like, is it safe to say that you had a, a very busy 2020? How are you? Have you had a chance to just relax a little bit? What are you saying? Is 2020 over? Really? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's just been a continuum. It seems like it's been a continuum. It is different. So I will say, um, I do think that we got a little breathing room um, and it's not as intense. I think we're starting to find, or at least I am starting to find at least somewhat of a rhythm of how to operate in these circumstances, how to pivot. But, you know, we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, we are certainly in a different kind of, I think, uh, political landscape, but the fight isn't over. Matter of fact, in some ways it has intensified. You know, that whenever there's been black progress in this country politically, there's always been backlash. And so what we're seeing right now all across the South and particularly in places like Georgia, we're seeing the, leg the state legislators take up these bills to actually prevent black voters to disenfranchise black voters and make it difficult for voters to participate in the process, given what our, you know, what we were able to accomplish. And so, you know, when I think about 2020, you know, I will say, yes, 2020 in some ways is over, but there is a continuum of work that we're 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 doing um, related to that. Um, take a break. I don't know if I've been able to take a full break. I will say I did get to take a a, a breather. Right. So I was able to like, OK, and take a breather um, and was able to take a couple of matter of fact, a week off um, and and really be able to do some some kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say calming down because I kind of, I, I had to sneak in work during that time too, but oh, no. you know, nevertheless, we are in a different, it's a different phase of the work and I'm really happy and proud of the work that we were able to do in 2020. And, you know, I tell people, I don't know if we're going to remember what happened in 2014 or 2018 or 2019. What I know for sure is that all of the history books will make reference to 2020. So it was a very significant year. Uh, but I also think that 2021 is showing itself that it will also be a significant year as well, particularly as we're talking about what governance means. Well, could you tell us a little bit about how you and your organization played a role in 2020? How did you play a part in what the history books will hopefully report back? So, you know, part of our organization, what I'm really proud of is while, you know, we saw a lot of the work manifest in 2020, you know, this has been work in progress. I've worked in the region in the South around power building for the last 27 years of my life, I along with Cliff Albright, who's the other co-founder of Black Voters Matter. And so there's, it's so interesting, over two and a half decades, there are different strategies that we've used and worked to try to perfect or um, really to help support our organizing work. And so in 2016, we both felt it was the opportunity to come together and really create an organization that could, we could bring some of those best practices together around power building. And that ultimately, if we were going to break up you know, this kind of structural racism, um, this backwards, what we felt was the precursor for fascism in this country, that fundamentally you could not do that without literally recognizing um, the role that, that many of the legislators and the power base in the South play in protecting and facilitating kind of the uh, um, uh, Trump's power and the and and the and some of the destruction that we see and some of the, the structural racism that we see in legislation. And so 
we created an organization in 2016 with the idea that we would build power. The way that we would do that, you know, is a couple of ways. One, that we would certainly uh, address the issue that the South is not red. I say this all the time. The South is not red. It's just been underinvested. You know, and I think we have shown, we have the receipts um, to show that when you are able to make an, a, an investment over time, when you're able to build out the ecosystem and help tap into the capacity that exists, we can make a difference. And so one of our first races before even Georgia that um, many people know, know us um, is that we were one of the groups that worked in the 2017 U.S. special U.S. Senate race, which was in many ways people thought was just kind of an impossible long shot. And in some ways it was because in the state of Alabama, that's a deeply, deeply, deeply conservative and reactionary right state. And so to be able to tap into the opportunity that existed in that year we wanted we were able to kind of test our strategy and our strategy was how to connect rural communities and rural organizations with urban work and that we would have a strategy that wouldn't just focus on the large cities but a strategy that would focus on building a statewide operation throughout the uh, throughout the state of georgia i mean the state of alabama by focusing on black voters but there are a couple of things that we did different the distinctions i would say is one of the distinctions is that we shifted where the focal point would be so instead of the focal point being around the candidate or the political parties that we actually made the focal point be the voter, you know, and I like to say that not only did it work in 2017 when we're looking at Alabama, it wasn't that, you know, you saw these record numbers of black turnout. It wasn't that people were so excited about Doug Jones. Quite frankly, most people didn't even know who he was before he ran for office, but what they were excited about their own agents and their own power. The same thing if we fast forward to 2020. Um, around what happened in Georgia around um, President Biden. President Biden actually garnered more black votes in the state of Georgia than President Obama. Certainly, we don't think that people were more excited about President o Biden than they were President Obama, right? I'm saying that because there is a nuanced way in which I think black voters um, engage in a process that is far more sophisticated, you know, than we've been given credit for, that we're very pragmatic and practical voters, but we also literally, just as anybody else, we're actually looking for not participation, but for power. And so we were able to shift the work that it centered a very differently. It wasn't centered around, like I said, the candidates of the party, it was centered around people using their agency, recognizing that they had power and understanding that if collectively we showed up, we could actually impact the elections and really be able to reduce some of the harm happening in our communities and move move pieces forward. And can you talk a little bit about um, ex like your specific tactics and how you mobilize? Because I've heard that um, you know you go up to people and you have conversations. You really listen. You don't just tell people register here or are you registered and walk on by if they're not because they're not important to you anymore. Um, you listen and you also are really honest with people, it seems like you don't sell them a bill of goods about all the difference that this vote is going to make um, for their lives. And so can you talk a little because it, it's different from how I've heard mobilization and not only even mobilization, but also just working at an advocacy organization. It's different. It is Listening is different. different. It's very different. We we were very intentional. You know, we think that the the it's really interesting. There's kind of this model that the most effective way to mobilize is to evangelize. We believe that the most important way and the most effective way to mobilize is actually in the listening, right? And right. so in that process, we approach it very different. Not to go around to communities and tell them what they need and tell them that you all need to do this because if you don't this like operate with this kind of fear proposition but we're actually going and operating with a power preposition, right? That says that you have power and that you are in the center of this. And part of showing that you actually respect the voices and that you, you respect that folks have power is quite frankly, is in listening that as we go around the communities, when we first started the organization for six months, six to seven months, Cliff Albright, Cliff Albright and I, you know, got in a car and we went around in the back roads throughout seven states in the South. And we had listening circles. We literally just would go to communities and say, let us know, you know, what is it that 
um, your community is facing right now. Tell us about the power dynamics. You know, what is it that you desire to see? And we would just listen, right? We would, it would, it would be the context of it, but we would just listen. And in that listening, it informed our strategy. And so in our strategy, what we heard consistently is that people felt like they were exploited. Every election after election, they're only treated as if they're numbers, not mm -hmm. that if they matter. And so one of the distinctions that we made was that when in our listening to people, when folks would come to us or when we're out on the streets and there's a voter that says, I don't want to vote because, you know, I don't want to register to vote because I don't believe that this system works for me. I don't believe that they're going to do what they want to do anyway. So instead of engaging in an argument to try to tell them how wrong they are, what we believe is that their position is valid, that what they are feeling is real for them. That is their perspective. And in many ways, it's real for many of us. And so we actually affirm that they have the right to feel the way that they feel. We actually affirm that we're actually interested interested in what they have to say, what their vision is, and we actually affirm that we're willing to stand with them to change those things that they don't like. And because we're coming from that starting point, it actually leads a different kind of framing around authentic voice. So when they see us coming, we're not just engaged because you're a number. We want you to do what we want you to do. We want you to sign the paper because we think you need to sign the paper. But what we think is what is, because that's very transactional. For us, we think this process should be transformative, that as we are engaging communities, as if we honor them, at, in a way that we honor and listen and respect them, that that should be an exchange that our work is being informed. And what we're doing is actually sharing what we've heard from others, what our work is, and then so that they have the opportunity to be self-determined. What we have found is that's far, far more effective. You know, I think the second thing that we do is that we actually incorporate culture in our work that part of the voting process, particularly in the Deep South, has been traumatic. It is not a good experience to stand out in line for three, four, five, six hours. I myself last year in the primary, I remember crying, right? Because I felt so powerless standing in line when I knew on the other side of town in predominantly white areas that they were not having the same experience. It is very, uh, uh, um, a very traumatic experience for many of us. And so in that part of our goal is as we're organizing, it's not organizing people as if voting is the end, but that voting is the means to an end, that it is one leverage of power that we can use. And part of what we do is in the work that we do, we actually um, incorporate culture that when we're in local communities that letter like literally instead of it being centered around kind of the vote we center it around what is indigenous in that community and so we also use tools that I, I like to share I think that distinguishes um, this work around really you know the one thing about about social justice we are some serious people right Molly we are some real serious people oh dear yeah <laughs> yeah I fear I fear that's true you know, and, and but unfortunately, people who have already been weighed down at work, they're also sharing their own kind of experiences to just come to their doors and tell them again how much power they don't have to come to their doors and tell them who else is trying to break them down to go, come to their doors and just share fear. I'm not sure that's effective. At some point, even the human body is only so much we can take. We're going to shut down. And so what we do is doing the opposite. We're coming and bringing the issues as opportunities for us to really create the nation that we want to create. So instead of raising it out of the context of fear, we're raising it as an opportunity of somebody is making a decision about us and we need to be a part of that decision making process. And what is your vision? And so that we're driven more around the vision and authentic voice as we're doing this work. And I think those are some of the distinctions. And then the last thing I'll say um, is that this, la this past year, we were able to support um, and through our grant making arm, we were able to support over 600 organizations. We invested $10 million directly in those organizations. You know, what I've seen is we were very intentional about, about not creating what I call an empire building model. And there's different models and they have their different level of effectiveness where it's about us collecting the resources, us doing the programming and then getting other people just to join us. For us, we want to do the absolute opposite. So instead of seeing ourselves as a new branch of let's say the, if you're using a military analogy, 
Instead of us seeing ourselves as the army or the navy or new military branch, right? What we saw see ourselves as as special ops. That the soldiers are already in the field. That the army is already there and in place. And what they need is reinforcement and support. And so, in doing that, the communities that we work in, we're actually investing dollars directly we're providing tools whether that's text messaging whether that's training around GOTV putting a GOTV plan together and sometimes that actually means that we fill in the gaps so that literally the operation can be built out and expanded but instead of it being centered around Black Voters Matter and the Black Voters Matter um, chapters because we don't have Black Voters Matter chapters we are the special ops crew that comes in with those communities because those are the folks who are going to be there day in and day out when there's not an election, those are the communities that will have to respond if there's a, a an issue of police shooting or police violence. That is the community, if there's a flood, that are going to sh show up as first responders. So for us, we wanted to make sure that we created an organization that would be in service of building the capacity of groups that are already located and rooted as part of the fabric of a community. Another thing that really struck me about how you approach this is um, the long game that all of this is playing? Because another thing I heard is that you talk to kids, that you don't have to be 18 years old and older to take part and to also be worth talking to, that this is really about a community and the community is an ecosystem. Um, and if everybody is committed in some ways, then we're all supporting each other towards these broader goals. And again, the broader goal isn't necessarily, as you said, getting to the polls, that's part of it. The broader goal is this larger vision. That's right. And our vision, even when I think about democracy, you know, we talk a lot about that we're doing this work um, because we want to save, protect, expand democracy. You know, that's not my starting point. <laughs> I brought, people will probably be shocked to know that's not what I think. I'm not doing this work for the sake of just saving democracy. I am doing this work for the advancement of humanity, that that is what I'm doing in the work. You know, I see democracy as a means to an end, not an end in itself, right? That democracy is only as good as we're using it as a vehicle to actually advance on the conditions that human of, of humanity. That for me, and when democracy no longer serves that purpose, then I have no need for it. And I'm raised in that because I'm, I also live in a country that we've made these systems and these ideologies be greater than the people. Mm -hmm. That we have literally used this God, that used this, this term, the terminology and under the space of democracy to bomb and kill people. We've right. used democracy to push folk out of their communities. I'm raising this because I think it's important that we really center what this is really about. All of our work should be around the advancement of people. If it's not, then what are we doing? And so part of our work and what we're engaged in is really around not just getting a transactional win, because what we have always witnessed, we all, we're all we witnessing right now, a transactional win can also be unraveled, right? But then when you're changing the culture, when you're changing and literally shifting the value system, when you are capturing the minds, the hearts, the imagination and spirits of people, it is much, much harder to oppress people, right? When they're tapped into their own power. It is much, much harder to take advantage of people when they're seeing the power of the collective and moving together. And so for us, part of while our work is rooted in civic engagement and turning out the vote, our larger work is to literally remind humanity, to literally remind, of, remind us of our own humanity and to really be able to touch those who have been marginalized, to remind them that they have power and they have agency and they have the right to determine what governs them, who governs them and under what conditions. I'm curious, you've been doing this work for decades at this point. This election cycle was a very different backdrop than previous election cycles. Did the um, summer of protests, did COVID-19, did any of these factors which sort of laid the foundation of how people felt going into this election make it easier or harder or just different from previous elections? Were people more excited to get take part or did they feel more just sort of dejected about the whole thing? Oh, that's such an excellent question. You know, I think it would, there were ebbs and flows to that. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I, I, I was getting ready to give you one answer, then I thought about another period of time. I, mm, no, you know, I remember early on, particularly when COVID-19 first hit, 
and organizations were faced with how are we going to do our GOTV work? We can't go door to door. We can't do our traditional work. And there was an, 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 uh, a moment there that people were really feeling. I didn't see the excitement that the the last thing on people's minds <laughs> was around voting. They were, we're not trying to live. Like we're trying to live. They were not trying to talk about voting. They didn't care about voting. You know, even even those that were upset with Trump at the time as a priority, voting just simply wasn't a priority for them, right? Um, and so I think that there were different um, there were different things that led to what I call the perfect storm. I do think that the 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 summer of uprising. I do believe that that in itself, you know, put some of the issues around structural racism that we're dealing with in this country that we have well that we're not dealing with in this country put it on the forefront and it was so the George Floyd we literally watched collectively how this the very life was drained out of a man's body just because another person didn't think that he had value and so I think in many ways it pierced our consciousness of what had already been happening but to see it and to witness it in the way that we saw it and witnessed it right and then to have young people come to the streets right the largest protest ever in the history of this country and if you looked at the diversity of the protests in every single state there were protests uprisings right and then you saw you saw uh, African American um, young folks you saw Latinx you saw white brothers and sisters you saw indigenous brothers and sisters and Asian brothers and sisters and gender non-conforming and what you saw is we actually saw this America what is possible when we come together and we work and we we literally are in alignment around the protection of life that was a very powerful I think transformative moment for me it was very different for me to experience I've not experienced that kind of uprising neither have any of us in this country being that that's the largest uprising so I think we had that along with this backdrop of while and we know that structural racism has not gone away, right? But to have the highest office in the land to literally align themselves, openly align themselves with white nationalists, that had not been my experience, right? It had been the experience of my 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 parents and my grandparents, but like the the blatant um, the blatant public display of that, I had not, not experienced before. And so even that called me to a certain level of consciousness. You know, and then I would just say on the backdrop of even the Black Lives Matter movement, that while I have been doing voter work and been doing social justice work my entire life, that called me to consciousness as well. It was like, you're not doing enough. And I felt that even in the midst of all the work that I had been doing over the years, I needed to really focus more on institution building, that I needed to actually, even the work that I'd done in philanthropy, where I had been for a number of years trying to get philanthropy to move resources, I was like, I can continue to beat that drum or I could find, I could create a, uh, an institution that could actually create and bring those resources on the ground. And so that's what I did, but all of that, I call it um, a result of the calling of consciousness that I think that we our consciousness. There was a calling of our consciousness that last year, you know, I do think that in many ways we've all hidden behind American exceptionalism. You know, if last year didn't teach us anything else, if COVID-19 didn't teach us everything else, it should have taught America, listen, y'all, you got some problems that we well, and also to people talking about, you know, while President Obama was president, that we were in a post-racial society, that we could gut the Voting Rights Act, the Supreme Court could, because we're, we're good. President Obama's That's president must be over and done. But that right. was not the conversation going into this election cycle at all. At all. And I think we show, you know, what we saw is we witnessed. We all witnessed the vulnerability of what happens when democracy is unraveled. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many phone calls I got and how many postcards I got from people in California and New York saying, please, what do we need to do, right? It was, I think it's really poetic that those voters who were ground zero in Georgia that we witnessed in 2018 being disenfranchised, that we found that all of our fate, our political fate in this country actually boiled down to those same voters to be able to shift the dynamics on making sure who controlled Congress, you know, or make sure who was in the White House. My point is, 
if we haven't learned anything else, the one lesson we should know from 2020 is that we're all connected, that there is an interconnectedness of all of us, that my health and well-being can actually impact your health and well-being, that my ability to be able to vote actually can, can impact your political future and who governs you and what political party represents. And so I think that, you know, if nothing else, I'm hoping that we get the lesson that I think 20 and 2020 that COVID-19 and other circumstances came to teach us. It teaches us that literally humanity is connected, that we're all connected, that whenever there's an action, right, there's a reaction, that we're all, that there is a ripple effect on what we do, what we fight for, and what we speak to, and that ultimately, if things are to be better, it's not because the, we've got these elected officials in office. It is going to be because the people demand that it's better. And when the people rise up, we win. I also wanted to ask you, you know, you have so many really in this from somebody I've been working in advocacy space for a while to me, it seems um, you have very different ways of looking at these things that feel in some ways very like, oh, right, like treat people like humans and and, you know, we can all come together. But I'm curious how you came to some of these ideas. What what were the moments in your life, I know you ran for office at one point, that sort of turned it around and set these light bulbs off and set you on the path ultimately to co-founding Black Voters Matter? We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. We shall not be moved. You know, even in that song, what is beautiful about that song is it's really con talking around about, you know, how grounded we are and how connected, I think for me, how connected we are and how literally our roots of resistance run deep. You know, and I think that part of getting to, to this place wasn't because I had these amazing political ideologies. I didn't develop that until I got older in life and was reading. It wasn't because I saw, I was upset about what this party did and what this party did. None of that, you know, it was literally centered around, and it might sound a little sappy to some people, but I actually love people. <laughs> like I, I love human beings and it, um, it bothers me to see human beings hurt, right? It bothers me of seeing a nation that is the wealthiest nation in the world. Why do we have over 30 million, 38 million people who are living in poverty that we can do better? And so what drives me is this fundamental belief that, that I do believe that love changes things, that I do believe that, you know, part of what will shift all of this well, I really firmly believe this. I don't really believe that it's going to be strategy, <laughs> um, that it's just going to be strategy that's going to change the political landscape. I don't think it's going to be having the most charismatic president in office. You know, I don't think it's going to be having the most lobbying groups. While all those things are important, I think it really boils down to can we literally tap into the ultimate belief that human beings have value? And if we literally tap into that, what is possible? And so, quite frankly, my work has been driven and shaped my entire life of wanting just for people to be better, just wanting us to do better, wanting us to live better. You know, one question I'm curious about is how do you sustain that empathy? Um, I, I know when I'm tired, my patience with my husband just goes down <laughs> in, in radical proportion. How do you do it? You know, part of it is um, the arts, you know, just as I was singing, like literally I pulled strength from the arts. You know, I think something about creativity and maybe this is because I'm an artist, you know, whenever um, I think creativity uh, allows you to operate in a space of abundance mm -hmm. and, uh, and allows you to tap into like just this unlimited possibilities and potential. You know, part of the reason why I have, I've been on a marathon of looking at uh, uh, Marvel going back in the timeline, looking at all of the Marvel movies so I can catch up with WandaVision and some of the other <laughs> shows that are out right now. And what is so remarkable, why I love them so much is because, you know, what I see is I see this kind of imaginative thinking that goes beyond the boundaries of what we normally see. And I think that's what it's gonna to take to change 
this country. And so what gives me strength, you know, even, and, and I, and let me say, I, there are moments that I'm like, what am I doing? Is this going to work? Is this going to matter? You know, there are moments that I'm doing the work and, and we get a victory and then I, you know, we get a victory. And then now all of a sudden we facing a hundred bills, um, to try to prevent and, 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 um, limit black voters from participating in the process that can be very disheartening you know however you know there are a couple of things that i tap into one is i tap into create you know the creative arts as an artist i write i write plays i write songs i sing sometimes yeah, you're I a beautiful sing. singer i was you. praying that you would sing <laughs> at some point i'm so glad you just did it on your own thank you so sometimes i tap into that the other thing is sometimes i literally tap into what I was sharing around my imagination, that I actually close my eyes and think about what is possible, right? And like, I think sometimes we have to do that. We have to really think about our radical reimagining. So we're not just responding to what's before us now, but really think about what ha what is what is possible, where all the possibilities are, and which leads me to my third and final thing. You know, as part of, I am a, Molly, I am a black woman that grew up in the deep south in the racist state of alabama that was the first capital of the confederacy right you know i looking historically knowing the history of my family knowing the history of my people i mean by every other circumstance we should be here right yet i'm here right i'm here in a system that while there were those who didn't even couldn't even see my humanity didn't even think that my ancestors were were had a, a sense of humanity even treated us like we were not human yet here i am i'm here and so it is i draw from the hope of the history of my people that actually keeps me grounded so anytime when i am feeling like oh my goodness i want to throw my hands up i remember people like harriet tubman i remember people like on um, the women in my family, I remember those that in spite of the circumstance stances, they still had a vision, a hope and a belief that if they tapped into the love of humanity, that they could transform their society and their conditions. And, and, I, and I am a result. I am their receipt. I am a result of how that is possible. Mm. Uh, to wrap up, you, you mentioned that you are ramping up all over again. What are you doing and how can we all help? Thank you for asking. We are Black Voters Matter Fund and Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute. We, one of our principles is 365 a year, you know, that, that we work every single day. We don't believe that it's just around elections. You know, part of what I think has been very damaging in the process of keeping people engaged um, in the democratic process is that it's so cyclical. You know, it's very episodic. Like here's an election and then we come back to you and it's come back. You know, think about those friends that only come around when they want something. Who wants to see them coming, right? But those friends that you actually have an ongoing relationship with, you know, those are the friends that have a certain kind of value in your life. And I think it's the same thing as we're building power. And so many of those communities that we have been working with um, over the years, we continue to work with them. We actually have some elections that we're looking at, we're working in um, uh, in South Carolina, local elections in the next two weeks. We've got other local elections that we'll be working with in, in uh, May in Mississippi and Louisiana. So part of the way that we show up, which I do think is a distinction, is we just don't show up when there's a presidential election or when there's a statewide election, we actually believe like what they teach us in poli sci, all politics are local, that we literally support w local communities, whether it's um, for a local sheriff's race or local um, school board race. That's really how you build your infrastructure out. And so part of what we will do be doing, a couple of exciting things, we're actually working in 12 states. We've just expanded to the great state of Texas. You know, quite frankly, I was afraid of Texas. I was like, that's a pretty big state. But working with the organizations and the groups that we have been partnering with and working with already, you know, and in light of what they're experiencing right now, um, I'm extremely excited that our work is expanding in Texas. Um, in addition to that, we're also building up a uh, legal advocacy um, space in terms of where we'll be training the groups that we work with, you know, and working with partners like ACLU um, and be able to provide some of that support for the groups on the ground who are literally the front lines around voter suppression um, and will be on the front lines when it comes to redistricting and other areas. And so I'm really excited about that. You know, and the third thing that I'm really excited is that we're actually building, building out our training component. You know, we are an organizer of organizers. And so literally being able to add 
add and put new tools online as well and, and connect with our national partners to provide those tools to grassroots groups. We're really excited about that. So we feel like we've got a good head start. We've got a great foundation. We've got an amazing group, um, uh, a cadre of groups that we've been working with, and we're just going to for forge forward and continue to base bill. Well, well, Tasha, thank you so much, not only for this conversation, but for all the work that you do and the way that you inspire us to think a little bit differently about doing this work. I mean, I, I feel just personally very influenced by this conversation and also reading about you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we love ACLU. You all have been an amazing partner in this work with us. So thank I'm so you. glad. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. To get more of these conversations, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell or subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts.